My name is Kareem Kirkawi. I work for Evolve Performance and I'm based in New Jersey. I look after a lot of our educational components, our support, our onboarding, things like that, especially with force plates and our force deck system. Um, it's definitely, in my personal opinion, for, for several reasons, an iceberg system because you'll think, okay, we got a good handle on stuff, but then there's so much more under the surface too. I mean, Nordboard, amazing, fantastic, but super simple here. Crouch here, go down as slow as you can, and that's pretty much it. Uh, but here, I mean, we can, we can spend days, weeks, months, I mean, it's just so much going on to it. Like, it's, it's very much like uh, the, the creator of Nintendo once said about video games, it should be easy to learn, but difficult to master. So you can pick it up super quick, but then once you start collecting data, what does it all mean? Once you start thinking about, okay, I've got a certain program that I'm working with, that's gonna be different testing than another program. Then you go more specific, certain athletes, or certain positions, et cetera, et cetera. So it really gets um, detailed uh, once you start talking about force play. So the education stuff I look after, et cetera, et cetera. But then also, as far as the region from Boston to Montreal to Washington, D.C., if anybody needs anything and say, hey, Kareem, we're looking to get a, an enforced plate system, whatever, but I handle that stuff. So, been with the company two and a half, almost three years now, so things are going super well, and I'm uh, here to talk about force plates. So, this is a presentation I put together um, a little while back, obviously, but a lot of the components are still the same. So, I think maybe I can just use this as the, the starting off point. If you want to spend five seconds on the slide, awesome. If you want to spend 25 minutes on the slide, no problem. So we can just breeze through this and then, and then get going with that. Um, I'm finding that it's tricky to talk with this on. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to go to one message. Right. <laughs> no there we go. <laughs> oh, thank you, really. Um, all right, so, and maybe now you can hear me a little bit better as well. Uh, hi. So baseline testing, uh, the CMJ. So this is a CMJ only presentation, I believe, right? Yes. If I remember from one slide ago. Um, Creating programs that are on key results and then considerations for monitoring. So we'll look at a few of those concepts. Uh, so obviously you folks know your way around the force plate system. I like this slide. It's pretty straightforward and, and pretty pretty simple. So as far as force plate, as far as force depth, we'll get an idea of what someone's physical capacity is. So we'll be able to look at very specific things: force output, RFD, velocity. So whatever they're kick, like, assuming it's a max effort test. And more specifically for today, it's a max effort CMJ, counter movement jump. If it's a max effort CMJ, then we will understand what this person's ability is at the max level. So physical capacity, what can they do? How fast can they drop? How, how high can they jump, etc. So I'm leaving a little bit off to the side the idea of movement strategy and like how they do it and execution, etc. because we we'll talk about that here. Equally, if not more important, is the movement strategy. How do they achieve that physical capacity? So if someone says, hey, my vertical is 19 inches. Okay, that's awesome. We got a number. It's a max effort. This person had three to five reps. Very cool. But if we notice the movement strategy, this person was, let's say, 60% leaning to one side on the way down and on the way up. So we have a 60-40 asymmetry. It's good to know what the 19 is. But understanding how that person executed the movement will give us two or three key ideas or, or key points to, to move, uh, move forward with. Number one, if they can achieve nine, uh, 19 inches on a 60-40 split, if they're able to incorporate that lesser used side, that 19 might be 20, maybe 21. So again, the more someone leans onto only one side, the more it becomes a single leg jump, essentially. Number two, we get an idea essentially of, I don't say injury risk, but if someone is overusing one side, it might lead them down the road of over, uh, overuse and or compensatory mechanisms that play into it. But then also number three, to give us an idea, maybe it was part of the injury history. Maybe something has happened in the past and they're still 60-40. So, you know, there's, there's other components that go into that, but understanding what someone can do, how they arrive at doing that thing or getting that number or earning that result, We'll give you an idea of essentially those, those concepts and some other ones that we'll talk about as well. So movement strategy includes asymmetries, leverage attributes. So if someone, beg your pardon, if someone essentially um, is a 
let's say a, a seven footer uh, basketball center, long limbs, maybe not the best squat technique ever, um, we can understand a little bit of their movement strategy if they're a hip hinger. Because essentially, anybody can hip hinge. If they, if they squat down this way, like anyone can do this and do a vertical jump. But the idea is, if someone has especially long levers and they're in basketball and, and their they're kind of understanding of a, of a triple flexion on the way down isn't quite what, let's say, a, a bar a bar friendly or a bar experienced running back who might be 5'9", 5'10", that, that movement pattern might be a bit different. So again, with a seven foot individual, basketball, da 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 all these components come into it, we start to understand a little bit more of why this person might want to move a certain way because of phenotype. Maybe not because of strength, because again, whether it's per pound or just overall absolute strength, we might see that he or she uh, is, is up where we need to get them. But the idea of how their body is built and what they prefer to do, and also the psychology behind it, do they understand that this isn't really the most effective way to jump, and that they should squat down, shirt up a little bit more, hips back, etc. They might have all those things converging and then showing us the movement strategy and say, okay, you know, they got a 19, but the strategy isn't, isn't fantastic, whatever the case is. Um, and then finally, is rating the status. So if someone routinely gets a 19, again, uh, whatever the asymmetry is, whatever, how their body is built and uh, what their movement pattern looks like because of components like that, if they routinely get a 19, and then one day they show up and they get a 19, but we say, you know what, something's up. This person, I would imagine, is fatigued because two game road trip, played every minute, and I'm thinking in terms of soccer, I'm thinking of other components as well. Uh, we're in the middle of midterms, the person had a cold last week, whatever the case is, you suspect that this person might not be performing at his or her best. Let's look at the numbers. They got a 19, but the movement strategy might be different. So the readiness status, they might be dropping a little bit slower instead of dropping down quick. So eccentric velocity has gone down. They might be dropping lower in order to give, them time, uh, give themselves more time to muscle up through the jump. They might be doing other things that we'll talk about because it's part of the presentation, but the strategy has changed even though the physical capacity has stayed the same. So jump height is a great endpoint, it's like an outcome measure, it's great, but not the best alone when talking about rating a strategy because other components that go into it that might change for that person to achieve the same jump height, but in a different way. Everything's framed in biomechanics, and then four step goes right there. So we'll tell you about physical capacity. Sorry, I keep messing with this thing. I don't even know if I need this. Uh, physical capacity, movement strategy, and then it's framed in biomechanics. We understand uh, those components are going through. Okay, so let's go in. So essentially, uh, let me see. The best way to do this, maybe I'll just do it this way. Can I open? Uh, Someone's data? Yeah, go, uh, if you go to football, yep. down there. Okay. Um, and go to Disa Isaac. You can. can you take up, can you instead bring up uh, just one of mine? No, sir. I may, I may not have the test on this one. Please I got please. you. On my um, what name do you guys want me to look up? Is there any stats on here? Um, we can cut this part out of the video here. Mm -hmm. Or I can do it that's for quick. Yeah, can we get Adam to jump? You want me to do that? Okay, uh, under anybody? Yeah. Alright, let's go under anybody here. You can, yeah, you can pick anybody. Okay, perfect. And you can stand on there, please. And the ship to your right. Okay, perfect. Okay, so. 1,000, 200, alright, whenever you want. So here is, here's a 
four straights. Uh, so here's the four straights. Switch it up a little bit. Um, so uh, athlete is standing still, 900 newtons, roughly 200 inch pounds. Um, start a movement. If we see a little upward deflection, it means this. First is standing still, it means this. And then they drop into it. So the flatter this is, the better. A lot of times, especially if you're more twitchy guys and gals, you'll see them standing here and then they'll kind of lift up, essentially give them a little one or two inch ability to do a drop jump. And not cheating, but maybe not the cleanest if the line keeps getting higher and higher. So if you see, woo, like this, this is one or two, man, what is it, five, 10 newton, something like that, this is nothing. That's okay. The flatter, the better. If you start getting like, like that, then you say, okay, let's redo it. Don't go on your toes and then drop down. Make sense? We're looking for a check mark here. Because that's going to show a quick unload and a quick reload for the jump. So if someone, and there's photos in the, uh, the presentation that I'm showing you uh, here. But if someone's kind of long and mellow, essentially they're doing kind of like this. They're here and then they'll, like that. Instead of, boom, and then up. The more somebody unloads, and the faster that they do it in, like this, you need to hit the brakes just that hard and just that fast. So you'll never, I'm going on record and say, you'll never ever see this. Nice and mellow, mellow, boom, like that. You'll never see that. Nor will you see this, whoop, oh, like that, to the end of the eccentric phase. Those two will always be in proportion. So if you drop down fast and hard, you better be ready to have eccentric strength, good firing, uh, muscle tendon medicine in order, so if someone's got a little patella something or Achilles something, they're not going to want to drop down super hard and fast because they need to reload super hard and fast. So, unloading here, this is the entire unloading phase. FYI, this divot here is 100% the same as this section here, this triangle. So I'll say it again, this here underneath, if I have a, a marker, I filled it in, it's going to be the same amount of ink or square footage as this here. Because you start at zero velocity. Here's your body, it's actually perfect. It's this blue line, it's kind of top of the green section. Whenever you're under your body weight, you will be accelerating down. I mean, technically you're accelerating down the whole time. Gravity is always working on you, but because you're putting out less force than your body weight, you'll be speeding downward. You're allowing gravity to win by a certain amount. Does that make sense? So this point here, my acceleration downward is going to be, if I was on point, my, my, my picking up of speed is going to be a certain level. But down here, it's going to be even more. So if I have this bottle, I'm, if gravity is pulling it down by a certain amount, I'm producing force, I'm not letting it go anywhere. If I do this, I'm letting gravity win. And you saw how fast it's going. Not too fast, but if I do this, that's the fastest it can go without me trying to smack it down and push it down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if this dot here, somehow, during the jump, was at zero, or if this disappears for a second and comes back, that means the athlete took his or her feet off the ground and did that. Okay? Again, is it cheating? Not really, but it's better to be in contact the whole time for a CMJ, for us to understand. So, the more you unload here over time, the more you need to reload to do what? Get back to the starting point. So just imagine here, this is your bank account. You spend this much money on, I don't know, some Prada loafers or a PS5 or a new puppy or something. You're in the negative. Not overdrawn, but you spend this much money of your bank, uh, bank account. To get it back to where it started, you need to put that much more money back in the account. You started at zero velocity here, you, you went into the net there by this much, now you have to break, and then here, you get back to zero. Does that part make sense? Sweet. That's, that's super, super, super important. Now, I know a lot of you guys uh, understand that concept, but the idea behind it being movement strategy dependent is super important because the eccentric phase, that's probably the most important phase. I'll say that because of 
two things, two big things. We can always talk about details, but two big things. Number one, it gives you an idea of is this person able to unload quick and reload quick? Are they fast and hard, or are they kind of, okay, hold on a second, I can do it, but just give me a little bit of time. In a sporting context, not like powerlifting, you know, you got all the time in the world to just lift something heavy, no problem. But, in a sporting context, I don't know one person that would say, you know what, you know, fast and powerful is good, but let's just go ahead for slow and kind of, yeah, you know, that gray zone, that in the mud, underwater movement. I don't know anybody that would say that. So speed and force production, so again, how wide this is, we want to narrow, and force production, it's not going to go up steep if we don't go down steep. That's important, so it's got to be boom, boom, like that. Speed, power, reactive, etc., etc. So, that's number one. Number two, let's do three points. No, that's number one, so the movement strategy as far as sporting context. Number two, injury prevention, uh, injury risk reduction. So if somebody can unload fast and reload quick, when it comes time to game day, they cut, blah, 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 and then they cut, they plant, and they turn, they load quick, and then they go, can you handle this, boom. If someone can't, and tissue demand exceeds capacity, that's when issues happen, part of the time. So what we're saying here is if they've got a nice, boom, steep RFD, they can, have, they can produce a lot of force, because you're getting higher and higher and higher, and they can do it in a short amount of time. So again, with the eccentric phase, you don't have the luxury of being able to spread it out and then get to a high level of force. Because again, just like we talked about with the bank account, in order to get up and high, you need to get down low. So you can't be shallow here, eh, kind of shallow, and shoot up like that. So you can't be, ah. So, number one, sporting context. Load fast, explode heavy, powerful, we want that. Number two, injury risk reduction. If the tissues can handle fast force production, and steep force production, then we're in business. And number three, the eccentric phase, as you can see, maybe, is shaded here in the software. I'll get the cursor. There's your eccentric phase. Right here, let's say that. There we go, something like that. Starts here, the max level is here for eccentric force. So, it is 100% the precursor to your concentric phase. The name of the game, Ladies and gentlemen, it's super simple. If you're talking about jump height, peak power, etc., the name of the game is very simple. Get as much concentric impulse as possible in a short amount of time as possible. Impulse up, time down. That's what we want. So, what's concentric impulse? Very simple. Uh, this is, I have 0.2 seconds and change for the concentric phase. Uh, side note, the software calculates the bottom of your squat in the way that I just talked about. So how much you unload by this zone here. When you reload, that's the line at the bottom of the squat. That's it. Because the software says, okay, you were under your body weight for this duration, and by this amount, so get, get my pen. This is where you cross over to body weight. This is your point of uh, eccentric peak velocity. This is when you're dropping down the fastest. And then the software says, okay, let me, let me calculate in reverse. Get the pen out, and then that's that's where the bottom of your squat is, like that, when you're at zero velocity again. So, name of the game is simple. In a short amount of time, because we're talking about sporting content, you want this to be fast. You don't have to drop, you know, your backside to the ground. You get three seconds to get back off the ground. It's too much. And as high a force as possible with the pen. How much shaded area can I get in this zone? For how short can it be? I'm not going to get a whole lot if my eccentric phase starts down here. Does that make sense? So start up here. It's like if John and I went out and did a uh, 100 meters, and I said, okay, you know what? We're going to do 100 meters, but uh, I'll give you a 10 meter head start or something like that. Uh, or maybe I'm 10 meters behind. That makes more sense. Something like that where it says, all right, we got a little bit of a head start. Where do you want to start on the race? That's it. Do you want to start halfway or do you want to start up here? Probably up here. So that's the idea behind that. It's not a fantastic analogy, but I'm all over to on those. Um, so what we want to see is the, the highest shaded area. So number one, eccentric phase, give you an idea of kind of that, that sporting context. Can they unload fast and, and explode uh, the other direction? Uh, injury risk reduction or some kind of mode of kind of understanding of can this person handle 
hard, fast, high force production. And then number three is the prelude to your concentric phase. Concentric phase, you start at the bottom here. The question is, how much force can you produce before your feet leave the ground and you can't push on the ground anymore? That's it. So, if John and I were doing a vertical jump, and we started, like the squat was the same depth, but he has been training, and he's sharp, and uh, he's on point that day especially, his eccentric force would be super high, and then even though his concentric phase might be a little bit shorter, he'll have more shaded area than I will. If I'm kind of, all right, here we go, not really going after it. And if we weigh the exact same amount, he puts in more force, so let's just say, for example, we both weigh 215. We're both 215, he puts in more force than I do, the, the microsecond we both leave the ground, his whole lot of force gave him more velocity. So he's got more fuel in his tank. So he'll go up higher. For my 215, if I'm kind of on a half a tank, I won't go up as high. That's it. Super simple. This impulse shaded area, which is one of our metrics and one that I love, per pound of body weight is key. So he and I both put out this exact, if, if we both put out the same exact picture you see here, but he weighs 20 pounds less than me, his velocity, his power, his jump height will be much higher. Because he has less than he has to push up. So the idea is per pound. So if you guys, especially uh, who work with football, look at a lineman, or let's say two linemen, on either side of the ball, and they got the same concentric impulse, but one of them has 15 pounds more than the other, whether it's just the way they are, or maybe we're looking at a rookie compared to fourth, fifth year, et cetera, there's a, there's a weight difference. The person who has the higher number doesn't necessarily have a higher jump or peak power. If you get the heavy guy who's got a little bit of a higher number, he's like, hey, look at the power, oh, they're better than that. But look at the lighter guy, he's got the same number, more force, I'm sorry, more force per pound, more power, more speed. Because remember, power is force and speed. Force times velocity. So that's the, that's the jump curve. So obviously we just spent 15 minutes talking about just this one line. And you need to get so many concepts. And we haven't even looked at a single metric. You know what I mean? But if I look at this, I see a nice check mark. And I see, this, this looks really good. So we see a check mark. Uh, we see an early, this is excellent. You see how it stays flat and then it only goes down towards the end? The higher this is, the better. The, the more he's able to carry it out, the better. The longer this, this drop down happens, I mean the later it happens, the better. So this is nice, this is robust. This looks good. Uh, what you don't want to see is when it starts here and then kind of goes this and it peaks towards the end. This is a lost opportunity in the early phase of the concentrate uh, phase. That's the early part of the concentrate. You want to see a high number, you want to see it out there. You might see folks who peak here and then do it kind of earlier. Like this here is actually, you know, a little half second, I mean not a half second, but a little bit earlier. What that means is, let's say, because I'm, I was raised there, if you're going to San Francisco and for some crazy idea you watched some you know, whatever movie or something, you say, you know what, I'm gonna take my bike and I'm gonna go down one of these hills. Okay, I mean, good luck. But, when you start off the hill, you're pushing into the bike. Steep, steep hill. Yeah, okay, I got it. Somewhere along the way, you better start pedaling faster if you wanna keep going faster. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Same thing here. So at some point, he was moving so much this way that his muscle contraction speed wasn't keeping up. If he was somehow able to move even super quicker and faster, now we're talking about type two fibers, we're talking about descending drive, neural activation, etc. This here might be a little bit further out. The tie, the takeoff point might not have changed, but because he was able to move faster throughout the whole movement, what does that mean? This will be a little bit higher and it will last a little bit longer. What does that mean? Get the pen out. More impulse. Per pound, he jumped higher, faster, uh, more power. Yeah. So that's not under impulse. There's one other point there. Oh, swimming. No, someone. You guys know? Yeah. yeah. I work swimming. Beautiful. So you never ever swing this way. You always look for fresh water. 
So when you, when you break the surface, you can look at the underwater surface, it's a lot of times like that. And it's a couple different options. The reason for that is, when you break the water here at surface, and start pulling, it will speed your body up, but at some point, this water here is going the same speed as your body. So it's not, you don't have any traction with it. So look at the underwater footage, they're always stuck and make a little S. So they're looking for the still water. And next time you guys in the pool, try it. Just do this for a few strokes. Like, All right, whatever. You don't get too far. It doesn't feel that hard. But try a few strokes like this. And you say, change, you can feel this, you feel this, and everything lights up. You're looking for still water. Same thing here. So once that water is going the same speed as your as your stroke, so the stroke being the contraction velocity, but the water in a sense, in a sense is your actual body, once those are matched up, this will start going down. A little deep sense. That's the curve. Any questions on that? Any thoughts? Or? Am I wrong with this? Uh, either I think I've heard you in one of our conversations refer to that, or it might have been elsewhere. It's like uh, strip, triple extension ability. Yeah. I think that. I think that was easy. Right? Yeah, for sure. So this zone also, if someone's especially efficient, uh, should be robust. So if they're able to time things properly. The other person could go back to basketball. Uh, not picking on them. I'm just saying they're here. If they're here. A lot of times you see in basketball from a little bit of this. For folks who might not be the most uh, efficient triple extenders or efficient jumpers. So they'll drop down, they'll hinge, hinge, and they'll take off. That will come as a kind of a bimodal look a lot of times. So you'll see boom, boom, it'll peak, it'll go down, peak again, and then come back down. So if you see that like this, a little, little kind of camel thing going, uh, a lot of times I might get a hinge. Or you'll see it guaranteed in an Abolikov jump. Whether it's here or here, you get down, you have to wait for this to happen if they're not the most efficiently timed. Not too often, ever, when you see someone go quack, quack, everything goes down at the same time, nothing at the same time. Especially if they're long leverage. Once again, some, some folks have very long arms, a lot of them play basketball. <laughs> so if you're here and you drop down, you have to wait. And then everything comes back up. So it's this back up. That's the point of uh, getting that second peak. So the first peak is that thing, woof, and then wait, 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 no, here we go, like that. Yeah. And then my, my other question was in terms of go back to the center stuff. Um, did you differentiate between breaking and deceleration? Yeah, sure. I know you did it briefly, but just kind of. Yeah, easy, no problem. Yeah. Uh, we got two dots, dot one here, and then dot two here. And they both have uh, orange dash lines. Dot one has this line, dot two has this line. That is your braking and D cell starting points. So think about it alphabetically. D comes before D. That's it. That, that helps me. Um, braking happens right here. It's the the millisecond, literally, because we sample at a thousand hertz, thousand every thousandth of a second we'll get a data point. So it's the millisecond of which the force starts to come back up. So you're no longer unloading down, down, down. You're still in the unloading phase because you are unloaded from your body weight. But you're no longer going down, 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 down. You're going up, 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 up. So that's your breaking start, start of breaking phase. You are starting to apply the brakes. Now, I had a conversation with somebody recently about this, and it's it really does come down a little bit to semantics. So well, hold on a second, Dream. If I'm breaking, that means my acceleration error is going this way. I get that because even here you're still speeding more and more downwards because remember here is where your eccentric peak velocity is and at the same point that your acceleration arrows start to turn. Think of the acceleration arrows or the, the, the rate at which you're developing speed. It goes with how far that gray line is from your body weight. You have small, 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 your biggest uh, differences here, which is still developing speed going downwards until this point here, which is the start of your decel phase. Now deceleration, you're going at a certain speed, you're going on the highway or whatever, like, oh, you're on a nice football stadium or whatever. Oh my God, there's a car in front of you. So you hit the brakes a little bit. You are pushing that you are decelerating from your current speed eventually to zero. So decel starts here. Peak eccentric velocity, slower, 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 bottom of the squat, zero velocity. So braking starts here, it's this entire phase. D-cell starts here from the point of peak eccentric velocity until zero. 
breaking is from the point that you say, you know what, I'm going to start developing a bit of tension until zero. Can I answer the question? Yeah, yeah that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, got a little dark there, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> that's a highway example. I just screwed at it. But then there's something different. John, you do the voiceover. I don't know, whatever you want. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's it. That's it. We talked about this. Okay, um, you know, continuation of what we talked about. Lyman, 350. Not this person, but someone exactly this body size, this body weight, etc. Uh, very mellow. <laughs> Probably don't want somebody who weighs 350 pounds unloading super hard and fast, and then reloading super hard and fast. So instinctively, my man knows. Okay, if I do that, it's not going to feel great. So I'll do a little bit longer, more mellow of an eccentric phase, and then shine the content it takes. Uh, as opposed to uh, a skills player at 195. So this is a very clean check mark. Check, check, like that. So high eccentric, uh, well, high peak eccentric force, which is roughly at the bottom of his squat. And then you can see a nice start, but then it drops off a bit. I mean, now we're splitting hairs, but he said the duration, 600 milliseconds for big man, uh, 450 for the receiver. Notice the depth, CMJ depth for the big guy, 12 inches, 14 inches for the receiver. Can't recall exactly what the height difference was, um, but I, I think we all know that uh, linemen aren't always going to be the shortest people on the planet, but neither are receivers. So all I'm saying is that the receiver's not going to be 5'8", and the lineman's going to be 6'5". Say, well, you know, per inch of body height, it's going to be kind of the same. Right? All I'm saying, this guy took less to drop further than this guy. That's it. Full duration, almost a second, 0.86, about 0.9 seconds for the full jump. So from here, until he left, and then a bit over half a second for, for this part. We're off roads with this now. So the shaded areas are the unloading, the unweighing impulses. Eccentric peak velocity, even though it's not at the point that I mentioned, because the point is actually here, it's it's greatly related to how far that, that red arrow goes down. Because if someone is going pretty close to the water, if they get pretty close to, to weightlessness or you know there's no force being applied they're going to have the greatest speed when the force does start to get applied again. So if I do this for one, uh, for one uh, half a second, half a second, that's the speed. But if I do this, it took me more force to stop that because it's got acceleration, it's got speed behind it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So this guy here, peak velocity at that point where the, the color ends is negative one meter per second, but then here is 60% faster, partly because he dropped his force output by that much more. So he, unlo he unloaded more, say unloading per kilo 0.47, unloading per kilo 0.72. So per kilo he unloaded more of his body weight. Uh, here's RFD per kilo, uh, a metric that I think is fantastic. So RFD, rate of force development. Couldn't be simpler. How much force they apply divided by what the time period is that we're, that we're talking about. In this case, D cell, talk about that phase. From the point of high, uh, of uh, eccentric peak velocity to the bottom of the squat, that's your time period. That's your x axis, that's your denominator uh, in RFE. How high it gets is your numerator, the number on top. So, let's take the receiver here. If this fella did this here for the jump, went from here to here, in that amount of time, we're going to get a certain number. But let's say that it took him now one, two, three times longer to do it. Same amount of force. Now we have three times bigger of a number on the body. Now we have a smaller fraction. So, so less RFD. So what we're looking for, like we talked about in, in that 15 or so minutes, we're just looking at that one gray line. We want this red arrow to be as high 
in as steep as possible. Again, more force, more velocity, and a shorter amount of time. Small uh, side note, I'd rather enjoy looking at D-cell RFD compared to breaking RFD. And here's why. So those two are super related. But you can't have one essentially without the other. So the breaking RFD fluid alignment starts at this form, this dot right here, and goes to this dot here. That's your breaking RFD. The thing is, that's always going to be a bit uh, uh, more out of focus or a bit more uh, diluted, diluted than this red arrow here. The reason for that, this red arrow deals with only the D-cell phase, from this point to this point. The reason I, I think that's more effective for the reason I look at that metric is you're dealing with max velocity to zero. You're dealing with a shorter amount of time. You're dealing with a body that's already mostly in triple flexion, as far as it will go. And you're also dealing with uh, higher forces. So those are the four reasons for that. Higher speed in this zone here, because you go from max speed to zero. Shorter duration in this zone than this zone. That makes sense. Athlete is already triple flexed. So we're talking about tension in the muscles, tendons, etc. So what can they do? And then also, we're going to be talking about asymmetries. So if they can't handle something on the left side, they're going to be loading on the right. But then also higher forces, because it's at body weight and above. So what can they do when the going gets tough, quote unquote? That's that. Um, this guy did better. Per kilo. So this guy here puts out more force, but he weighs much more. This guy here, maybe not as much force, but per kilo, a lot more force. So that's what we're looking for. By definition, what does he have to do? Here, hold this ball and avoid 11 other people trying to flatten you on the ground. Okay, probably want to be light, probably want to be powerful and quick. This fella here, I mean, basically has to be a refrigerator on a dolly. You know, move a little bit. I mean, obviously, respectfully, you know, they got amazing footwork, hand speed, all that kind of stuff, no question. But, doesn't have to do with this guy here. All that stuff. Can't move 350 the way this one's here. But different position, different parts. We talked about that. So, uh, force at peak, uh, he's under peak force per kilo is 20. Uh, this fella here puts out maybe close to 50% more force per kilo uh, than, the, than the line. In this case. Okay. Concentrating on pulse. 412, this zone here. How do we get that? Software samples at 1,000 hertz. Let's, let's, call it, let's say this yellow width-wise here uh, is one second. You'll get a thousand dots. One, two, three, four, da, 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 99, da, 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 1,000. A thousand dots right here. Each of those has a corresponding force value. When you add up all those super, super skinny rectangles, you'll get this shaded in area. So that's how we calculate that. So this shaded in amount of force done in this time zone was 412. Newton seconds. So Newton's times seconds. This fellow only, only 266. But then, is it on here? It is not. When you consider that per kilo, this is going to be your power explosive quick person over here. Um, didn't come out fantastic, but eccentric speed velocity, D cell RFD per kilo, concentric impulse RSI modified. So eccentric speed velocity, smaller player, uh, drop quicker. He's at a D cell per kilo. Smaller player at a higher one. Contra impulse, not respective of body weight. Big guy put out more force. That makes sense. RSI modified. RSI modified is reactive strength index modified. So classic RSI, if I put a box here and we did a drop jump, it's going to be flat time divided by contact time. So if someone flew in the air, let's say one second, and then they landed, we'll get the information. So they flew in the air for one second. Let's say that their contact time, the time they spent on the, on the fourth place before they jumped, was a fret with a microsecond. Get a big number over a small number, that's what we're looking for. Then the person comes in, that's another good metric. The person comes in, remember we talked about this, uh, fatigue, da da da, oh, ah, here we go. Their R size is gonna be all over the board. You got that 19 inch vertical jump, but it took twice as long to do it, therefore the fraction is gonna be smaller. Um, so obviously, small, smaller player had a much better RSI than the bigger player. 
Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. So our time modified is meters, so jump height, divided by contraction time or movement time. So if I'm standing here, that, that it starts right when I start to jump. When I start to unload a little bit. That's when the clock starts. And it goes until my toes leave the ground. So how high can you jump compared to how long it took you to do the jump? Here's some metrics here. We talked about all those, but this is a plain English version. You guys can have a look at the, the PDF it should be using. Questions on that before we start this? So I mean, uh, to like for anybody, like Doran specifically, because I know you got other stuff. Um, at any point, like if you want to throw a question or if you like have a time constraint. Yeah, please. Um, so that's I know we're going. We're just gonna roll. Yeah. Because he's giving us a lot of good stuff. So. <laughs> In the most simple terms, you want, like if you're looking at the graph, you want yeah. the concentric part to be as skinny as you can, and the concentric part to be as wide as you can. Basically. I mean, ideally. If you and I did the test, and, and we got the same exact jump height, peak power, et cetera, peak force, et cetera, ideally, I would love it if, if the person could do that in less and less time. Yeah. But you can't say, okay, the less time, the better, because then it might turn into this. Okay, less time. Let, let's do it fast, fast, okay. Like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's quick. That yeah. was a microsecond jump, but I was the vertical jump height this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like that, but yeah. If you're yeah. comparing people overall, like, that's getting your recenter part is. If the force is the same, and then a wider concentric part. I would, I would say, except for the wider concentric part, mm -hmm. um, you'll often see, especially with different movement strategies, that the eccentric part is what's going to fluctuate the most. Because at the bottom of a squat, when when it's go time, people take off. So yes, that can definitely fluctuate a bit, but especially if someone's fatigued, especially if we're talking about different position categories like this. Um, or with much, much different phenotypes, etc., for physical attributes, as far as you know, muscle fiber, so on and so forth, um, and levers, etc., then the eccentric phase will be the, the place where you see the most fluctuation, for sure. So that can be as long as you want it to be, right? This could count right here. So th this could happen like this. Like that. You know what? Let's just do this. Let's do that. Alright, so I'll do three jumps. I'll do a normal jump, a slow one, and then a fast one. So here's a normal jump. Four, one thousand, two, one thousand, three, one thousand, normal jump. Alright, now I'll do a, a slowish one. Now I'll do a fast, like, oh, coach said quick. Slowest jump has the highest peak power. Mm -hmm. Because I, I, again, we might want to look into like, um, what's it called? Uh, squat depth, one or two other things. But if we just take the face value, you'll notice that the peak power is still pretty clustered together. But for me, as I controlled the way down, I was able to maybe reinforce and think about exploding on the way back up. So I had a little bit more urgency, perhaps. Those are super, super close together. If someone said, hey, I got a 44, and someone else got a 45, I mean, that's gonna be paper thin. But, if someone said, hey, I got a 45, someone else got a 43, then that's when you start saying, okay, why is it like that? Especially if they're the same weight. But, you'll see that these other metrics are, are different. So, RSI modified. Look, oh my god, I got a 44. But you saw what the vertical jump was, it was terrible, it was like this. So, again, this is slightly misleading, unless you have something else going with it. So if this fluctuates quite a bit, because it's, it's based on two factors, jump height and contraction time, you need something else that doesn't move, or something else to compare it to. So you have to look at jump height. So my, my best, let's leave this one aside. My better RSI is when I did a normal jump. 
When I went down slow, it took me time to get down there and take off. So even though the jump height was very similar, the time it took was a lot longer. Um, yeah, see those jump height is nearly identical here. So here, it must have been the time. Jump height was terrible here. He said her D-cell. So this is probably the, the part where I would say is the, the more accurate reading of what I can do. This one here. This one I hardly have to hit the brakes going down because I went down so slow. This one here is super high because it was very, very short and I'm just stiff enough. You know, I can tighten it up if I need to. So even though the time is short, the amount was, was super stiff. If I try to do this slow, with this slow jump, this is going to be, I don't know, five, six thousand. Because you got longer time, and it's going to be super, super steep. You can get really high in that one second compared to that microsecond. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. Um, it's okay, Dan. Let's go. You can sit right here and Nelly see. Please okay. tell you to jump in another Okay. So here's. <coughs> Here is a uh, normal jump, regular jump. Here is slow. You can see that, that's clear as day. So if somebody, if somebody with the group that you're working with shows up a back center phase, I would be concerned. That's not fantastic at all. This is much better. This here, no. And see, look. Control. So you see, this, okay, so here's my quote unquote eccentric peak velocity, which is not fantastic. I hope I'm not flashing everybody. We can put a little pixelated section on that. Uh, please, John, thank you. Um, so here's the bottom of the squat. Look at it, it's taking time to get out of the hole. You see that thing? Okay, here we go, here we go, here we go. So again, this is the hallmark of somebody who goes down slowly and does not have the ability to hit that 180 and take back off. So this is a missed opportunity here for concentric impulse. Remember, that's the name of the game, plain and simple. So if you get a high concentric impulse, that means you did a great eccentric phase and you showed up on a time when it was time to triple extend. So, I mean, a lot of people ask me for like, what's your one go-to metric? Honestly, like RSI modified is probably the best one to look at everything, movement strategy and um, like outcome or jump height performance. But that can be a bit volatile, like I said, I can, I can get a 0.45 without even trying to do super shallow and super quick. But it's hard to fake concentric impulse. So if you have somebody who's eh, kind of like this, an eccentric phase, I'm sorry, I'm sticking literally to my back, with my back, because I'm just doing it. If you have a so-so eccentric phase, you're not going to have a great concentric shade in the area uh, result. Likewise, if you, if you start like this, and, you know, let me turn the key to the engine, you know, let her warm up a little bit, they don't get going uh, from the ground up. You're not going to have as good a result as if you say, boom, boom, like that, as we talked about. So here's, here's that boom, boom right here, ish. You know, I'm not trying to say I'm anything special with that. Here's that long, drawn out, you know, uh, missed it. And then here's that super shallow, quick. So this is pretty amazing. I mean, high numbers, we have 3,200 compared to uh, 23, thereabouts. But again, when we look at jump height, I clicked it, yeah, I saw me. I it. Uh, here we go. This is the gold standard, by the way, impulse momentum and inches. Okay, so, well, I mean, it's not remarkably different, but uh, trial one, got my best jump height. That was my like, straightforward, honest to goodness, let me go ahead and give it a jump. Trial two was a long phase, eccentric, didn't look too good. Um, but then also, now you can start getting, now you start diving into uh, the rabbit hole. Content duration, trial one, quick content phase, quick-ish. Trial two, longer content phase. So jump height, if you remember, was super similar between the two. They were identical pretty much. Um, but then you see the content the phase here was 60 more, so it's 40% longer here. They're like, hey, you jumped as high. Yeah, but the thing is, though, it took you 40% longer. The ball might have already gotten by you. Your, your defender or the opposition, whatever, got past you where they shouldn't have been. Or you missed the opportunity to, to be where you need to be. And then again, trial three, you're like, hey, that's super fast. Yeah, but I mean, I was just Mickey Mouse to show you 
how far aside you can really be a little bit misleading unless you have something like this that is practical. Um, yeah, and so, you know, stuff like the stiffness and everything. All that, like I said, was because I did a super short, but stiff enough, uh, what's it called, uh, jump. So if I can do this, kind of check mark this kind of performance here, like in a real jump, then that's awesome. But you see, I didn't unload as much. Here, I literally, let's see if I actually took my feet off the ground. I don't think I did. Oh, that's pretty close. That's pretty close. What is that, 26 newtons? 26 divided by four uh, is six. So all but six pounds of my body left the ground. So I only had six pounds of, of force on that. That's pretty much a little bit more than the clothes that I'm wearing. Um, we're not going to put that on, on video or anywhere else. <laughs> um, we're not going to do that right now. Uh, yes, coming out of the to do that. But anyway, <laughs> so that's like some concept of some ideas about how doing different jumps. And this is honestly, it's like a, this was a huge learning tool for me as I started to understand more about force plates. And then, well, let me just see, what happens if I do this a little bit slow and I do this? Let me see if I can just, you know, just, uh, just mess around with it, honestly. Then you start connecting it in your brain because you feel an exaggeration, an exaggerated version, and you see the numbers, and then you go, ah, click, aha moments, left and right, you know what I mean? Um, so that's an idea. Uh, Kareem, could you go into a little bit of um, some of the imbalance stuff now that was kind of next in your presentation? Oh yeah, um, sure. Potentially what would warrant some concern, especially with um, an athlete returning from injury? Okay. Um, and then potential interventions based on uh, information. Right. So based on my personal experience as a performance coach in pro soccer and a couple of years at, at a D1, all up, um, and rehab experience and personal experience, whatever, like these are the considerations that I would put into a force play analysis, these six. Magnitude always starts with that. So if someone has a 0% asymmetry and it's always been that, somehow, 0% that's a unicorn type of person, um, there's no reason for us to ask further questions. So long as, I mean, like I said, it's been in the past, zero. That's kind of point number two, the change in magnitude. So if someone, let's say, has 20% uh, asymmetry, and then he or she starts training and or rehabbing with you guys, and the number is getting smaller and smaller, we want to see that, that's good. But if someone shows up uh, training camp day one, has a 3% asymmetry, and then it's only getting larger and larger as, uh, can't progresses, that's clearly a red flag. Like why is this person leaning more and more to one side? Leaning, meaning not physically leaning, of course, maybe. They're also leaning towards it in terms of reliance. Why are they relying on it more and more? Uh, that's a red flag. But then you can also, you know, get more, you know, understanding behind maybe the fatigue response from that individual. Some people, not everybody, obviously, once they start getting fatigued, they might start leaning more or relying more on the quote unquote good side but the non-injured side. So that's another factor for fatigue monitoring. We talked about four or five metrics already. Eccentric peak velocity, squat depth, uh, duration, duration of durations, uh, jump height. But now we can add asymmetries to that. Uh, previous injury. So obviously if someone's you know, fourth or fifth year with you guys and, and gals, uh, and they've had two ACLs on the left and you know, a ruptured Achilles on the right, then maybe they show up with 13%, 14% asymmetry, and that's what we can do. And that's fine. It's no, you know, it, it, if anything, it's a testament to what they're able to achieve rather than any shame or kind of this, this negative thing. Like, Dang, you know, why can't I be in the yellow or the green zone? You know, I'm not doing something right, or my body's broken, or something like that. You know, now it gets more philosophical. You know, we, we manage the things we can, and we just keep moving forward, and just keep working hard, and, and trying to be positive about certain things. And that's obviously, you know, some of my stuff, too. Um, but if that person has a previous injury or injuries, then understanding what is reasonable or expected comes into it. But also the change in magnitude and self-report symptoms and performance. What does that mean? If someone had injuries before and had a 14 or 15% um, asymmetry on any metric or whatever, and it's, it's holding constant, that might be a, a great sign. If Number two, they're not reporting any symptoms or issues or discomfort to this or that. And number three, and I'm putting it third for a good reason, their actual performance. So we shouldn't put performance ahead of what the athlete's telling us. 
North, we put it in ahead of their long-term health or uh, how things are developing over time, aka change in magnitude. So if they're holding steady, uh, they feel fine, they feel positive, everything's good, they understand it's a management component, but then also the performance, tertiary kind of factor is where we're happy with it, obviously more the better, et cetera, faster, stronger, all this kind of stuff, then we're, we're in a holding pattern. So let's see if we can keep chipping away at it, but it's up to each and every one of you to make a decision of when things might be realistic or when things might need to kind of stay the course for a little bit. Support and position, um, well, I, I beg your pardon. So previous injury, if someone had an ACL and they use a hamstring graft and the person did a Norboard test, let's say one year post, I would expect some sort of asymmetry as well, depending on you know, that, yeah, in, uh, the rehab program, so on and so forth, whatever. So it could be an injury itself, so hurt my knee, uh, I can't load too much on the tell, whatever it is, or I got to tell on the ACL. Or it could be let's do a Norboard, or let's do a non-symmetric hamstring test with an asymmetry. It's not the actual injury itself, but it's a secondary uh, mechanism. Uh, that secondary mechanism can also be compensation. Support position. So, there are a few, in my personal opinion, and there's not been so many people that say anything otherwise. Um, and I'm, I'm welcome to the conversation or, or other ideas. Major League Baseball pitchers are probably the most at risk folks for developing asymmetry. So they have a high propensity for it. Each of their four limbs, two arms and two legs, has a totally different job description. It's 100% unilateral. I don't know anybody that's ever switched to right hand to left hand, but I mean, truly on any level, really. You should see me try to throw my left, it's terrible. Um, the uh, intensity is 100%. So you don't say, okay, you know what? I'm going to just you know, lob it this way, just for one pitch, give myself a rest. And then also, the, the duration is completely open ended. So there's no, like, okay, you got 50 pitches. Or, no, it's like, okay, you got to strike three people out, and then we can switch. But then also now you want to make sure innings and so on and so forth. So it's literally super, super unilateral, different job descriptions, max intensities, uh, and you've got such a little variety of different pitches you can throw. So there's not going to be one that's like underhand and then like a cricket kind of throw. It's always going to be in a certain in a range. And that's totally open ended. So understanding that, now when we start working with soccer, when we start working with swimming, swimming is probably one that has the least amount of asymmetries because. If this side is stronger than this side, I'm giving 100% effort, then I'm going to eventually start swimming in a circle. <laughs> so what happens is this side got to okay, take it easy. This side is going to be the got to be equal down, etc. There's a million different things to put in there, but half of that I'm saying is yes. Swimming, road cycling, and powerlifters are probably the ones that have um, the environment at least to be the least asymmetrical. The powerlifters, obviously, they can do a test maybe 60-40 like this. But you're only as strong as that 60-40 will allow you to do. So if you go 50-50, then obviously this side you know what you can do, but now you're saying to this side, hey, you know, pull your own weight or push your own weight or whatever, then you have higher numbers essentially. Um, so that's a little serious. Soccer. It, it's a mild irritant for me when I do read research that says, oh, we did research on soccer players and the dominant leg did this, that, and the other. Anybody, anybody who knows the sport knows, you know, if the person is completely right-footed, then he or she is going to be striking, passing, whatever with the right foot. Leave a simply cutting and agility and all that stuff So now this is going to be my flat leg. So it's going to be my better balance, better strength, maybe leg. This one here is going to be more for precision and skill. So when I see, you know, dominant leg in soccer research, it's like, okay, is it strength and balance dominant, or is it precision, okay, they have to pass in the goal, or like, you set up a little thing, and they use their dominant leg, and whatever, so. That can creep up, so if someone does a test, just be aware of that. Like an isometric test, if he does it, for example, a uh, female soccer player, um, who may come back from an ACL or something like that, and she's pushing, and we know she's right leg dominant, and she just had her right ACL repaired, I would expect, okay, and dominant uh, skill. I'd expect maybe the left side is a bit more. So that makes sense. Now you go back to magnitude. And it's okay, how does it change over time? Is my program working or not? Because obviously we have we have a current slash previous injury, and we know that she has a side preference on the left uh, versus the right, because there's force. And finally, occurrence and consistency are all in four steps. 
So when it happens in the movement, eccentric, concentric, landing. If someone has a huge asymmetry on the way down, the concentric phase is perfect, and they got a huge asymmetry on the way back, then something's up with this side not wanting to load fast and hard. Typically, oh, not typically, a lot of times you'll see eccentric phase, 15% asymmetry, concentric, 5%, landing, 40%. Because when you're landing, three things are happening. Number one, if, if, I'm, if I'm starting to jump here, there's no way that I can start to jump from a higher point than here unless I jump up and then drop down, but never mind that. So here's the highest point that I'll achieve. Meaning, there's only a certain velocity that I could possibly achieve going down. And a lot of that, like we talked about, is depending on how much weight I take off the plate. So, the landing part, I won't, the landing, I will be going at a higher velocity because I've achieved whatever vertical jump height, and my center of mass is coming from a higher height. So speed is faster in the landing phase. Number two, no particular order. Uh, there's far fewer proprioceptive demands uh, during a regular, during an eccentric phase of the jump because I'm either flat on the ground, I'm in contact, I know what's what. There's not going to be a whole lot of okay, the toe has to touch and then tie me into the. With landing, you'll be dropping at a faster rate, so your speed eccentrically is going to be higher. There's a huge proprioceptive and timing requirement. So someone got an ankle issue. Someone bruised their heel like I did a few days ago. So, something's going to be off on the landing phase. But then also the third part is the force output. So when I'm landing, I'm coming from a higher uh, height. And so when I hit the ground, you saw, I mean, 100% of the time, so 100% of the time, I would say, I mean, it's like a lot of percent of the time, the landing will be, will be a higher peak. Uh, if anyone wants to do a jump barefooted, I'll bet you money until we go, he's at the phase, landing, like that. Because nobody wants to land on steel plate barefooted and then pa -pa, like this. So they'll, they'll cushion themselves pretty darn well. So landing, higher speed, appropriate sense of demand, and uh, higher peak force. Also, last thing, when you put those three things together, you can't control as well, as well, how much force you apply and how quick during the landing phase. The eccentric phase, I'm in complete control. Kareem, drop down to jump. All right, cool. There we go. Okay, Kareem, hop off this 20-inch box and land. Once you contact the ground, whenever that is, whether it's like straight, like super fast, whatever, you're going to be going at a certain speed. You can't stop or change that. You can spread it out over a bit of time, but not as much as you can with the eccentric phase. So landing, again. So, like I said, 15%, 5%, 45%. Something's up here with rate of speed development, and a rate of force development, and how high that force can get. So when it happens, we'll, we'll give you clues. So if the eccentric phases, plural, are off, and the concept looks good, this person got a problem, doesn't want to push too much on one side. Finally, consistency. If someone does five reps, and an asymmetry analysis shows uh, we have five reps, we've got Let's say right in the middle, 12% asymmetry. If it goes 12% to the right, 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 super consistent, yellow zone. That's more of a concern for me than if it went like this. 20% to the left, 1% to the left, 9% to the right, 0% perfect, 5% to the left. Like a totally mixed bag. That person loads different sizes, or I'm sorry, different sides, and different weights and forces in the mouse. So that's much more of a mixed bag. So any court or field or athlete or person who would prefer to not be injured, I'd probably take that consistency, the inconsistency, small, medium, large, left, right, center, then someone who's in the yellow zone only, but only on one side. Even though, like I said, that second example is like two of them that are like, whatever, 15, 25%, I don't know. That's fine. Yeah. You know, from an intervention standpoint. <laughs> yeah. So once you identify an individual yeah. that, that, or that maybe something where like, okay, this is yeah. an issue, that, what's the... Uh, that, that's, that's where the fun begins. Because that's where there's, the, there's a Venn diagram, two components. You get 
the, this whole thing you just talked about in this circle, and then you get all of what you folks know and all of your expertise and understanding and what coach wants and what the player can do and what you think and da 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 normative data is in this other circle. So where that overlaps, you can call that your program. That's it. Here's the information, broken down, organized, boom, boom, boom. So this is essentially, quote unquote, where we're at with, a, with an asterisk on the change of magnitude because you can only look in the past and make plans for what you want to see in the future. So there's all that in one circle, but then here comes your experience, understanding what you think is best moving forward. So someone said, okay, I got a 30% uh, asymmetry on my eccentric phases, eccentric and landing, when I do a CMJ. I said, hmm, okay, so you do your analysis, okay, very cool. And then you say, okay, you know what we're gonna do? We're gonna start doing bicep curls. That doesn't make any sense at all. So, I mean, no one's gonna come up with that. So the strength of the program is dependent entirely upon the information we have, but more so the individual coach's extraction of meaningful substance from that information. So, I mean, I can put together a beautiful report and give it to a fifth grader and say, hey, okay, please train Penn State football. And I'm like, well, I don't know, I like the colors, can I have a t-shirt? Whatever it is. So we need the folks to understand what it's telling us to then put it together and move forward. So interventions, I mean, shoot. I mean, that's like a case-by-case, -case larger basis. But if I see things like, and I'm not trying to dodge the question, if I see things like a problem in the eccentric phase, my coach's brain says, okay, why does this person not want to load on the right? How can I improve that? Is it going to be single leg stuff? Boom. Is it going to be lateral, just whatever, triple extension work? Probably not a whole lot of that because we're not addressing the eccentric phase. But maybe it's going to be box drop box and land here. Okay, climb back up on a 12 inch box, land here. But then that's just me answering the question as a coach. Eccentric, loading, fast, hard. What can I do to, to increase that ability? Is it something that is, is a tissue capacity question, a neurological question? Is it sport related? If I see this asymmetry in a discus thrower, or a, let's just open it up, a thrower, how much of my pursuit of a 0% unicorn will actually undo their sport skill. At a certain point, you know, everybody's an athlete, but then you've got smaller groups within it. And then even there you've got positions, you've got individual like that. So it goes athlete, soccer, Penn State women's soccer, winger, uh, Alyssa, I don't know, you know, for example. So then for the athlete, you want certain things. But then as you get further and further forward, again, pro, uh, athlete, Throwers, da 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 Then you say, okay, do I want to go down that route? Yeah. Well, you've been rolling for a while now, too, so, I mean. Thanks. I realize I can miss all this. No, it's okay. Yeah, we got it on video. I'm KJ. Men's soccer, so this is going to be really great. Yeah, great. I just have a look at it. Yeah, I will. I appreciate you coming by. Awesome. Cool. Right, thanks, man. Yeah, appreciate it. Appreciate you guys. Yeah, she just uh, she got some some CMJ data this week. Oh, right on. With Very her, cool. With her group, so that's awesome. Yeah, yeah you love to see it. Yeah, yeah. Cool, man. Yeah. Does um, anyone else have any other questions? I know we've been rolling for a while, so we're gonna keep it short. But I mean, that was, uh, a, lot, that was a lot of good information. Yeah. Um, like I said, Dorn, I don't want to hold you hostage. Uh, feel free to ask questions and go. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, do you guys have anything you want to? Ask, see, do you don't? I'm not going to contact info, yeah. so if nothing comes to my mind, I'll resonate. I'm, I'm, way, I'm yeah. way down the road here. I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going anywhere. Before I forget, and before anyone asks any questions, Adam, too, I do want to show him our uh, Norfolk issue, potentially. Yeah, yeah. I can show him now. Yeah. Um, I do have one more question. Sure. One metric I get kind of confused on um, is force of zero velocity. Yeah. Can you show me where that is on the graph? Yeah. And, like, just what it is telling me. Like yeah, piece of cake. Where they're at in the jump. Yep. Yeah. Uh, zero velocity at the bottom of your spot. Okay. So in more times than not, it's going to be at or near your max force. So it's at the bottom of your squat. It's essentially, and if we talk about asymmetries, a lot of times you'll see people who have a preferred planting leg and or trying to avoid the other leg, the load on that side. So if I'm especially strong, and like I said, soccer, boom, boom, if, I, if my strong plant leg is here, 
when I go down from the squat, I'll tense this up and use this force to push into the plate and slow down all other body weight rather than 50 50. So again, force zero velocity, kind of force you pushing into the plate here before you go back up. So that's a key factor, I mean a key variable because it's a culmination of your whole eccentric phase and the, the kickoff point for your concentric phase. So you want that to be high, per kilo. So that's really odd. Process was pretty quick and add Check mark. Yeah. 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 So he also uh, has men's lacrosse. Okay. Yeah. That's one of his. Very cool. Yeah. All, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. He's in a he's in a tricky spot because from the waist down, the cross appears to be uh, symmetrical because you're running and planting and cutting and this way down to 360. But because you're throwing, yeah. I mean, you're not gonna. I don't know. There's, there's a whole other thing that goes into baseball. As far yeah. As some guys are so one side dominant. Yeah. As shooters. Um, Position specific. So if you have an offensive attacking, right, and he's just a lefty all day, yeah. you're probably going to see some similarities to maybe not a baseball pitcher, uh, but but some of the swing yeah. issues you might have with a hitter. Um, whereas like defensive lacrosse players are more two sided throwers. Okay. They're not as one side dominant. Or if you have a very skilled attacking, they can shoot full hand. Okay. So they're not going to be as asymmetric. Gotcha. So there's a point being there yeah. are some of those asymmetries to consider. And, yeah. But it's a little bit different by position. So I like the that idea of like a 360 game within the confines of the, the the lines or whatnot. But then also how an increase in like the well skilled ones can be you don't know what they're the, the demand on the body is different, even though the demand is pretty open. Mm -hmm. What someone chooses to be able to do, not choose, but can do to be left, right. No, mixed. I like that idea. So you have, he's got challenges, like he's got variance inside the group, depending on, like you just said, a, a couple of different approaches to it, what their abilities are. Yeah. I have sort of a logistical question. So I know this is like geared towards preseason, but yeah. um, how, if, if I'm getting these baseline measures, like what is your recommendation for how often like, is necessary for Yeah, good question. You know, it, and it depends totally on schedule and like yeah, yeah. how often they're in the weight room and how often they're yeah. out of the field and like things like that. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, good question. So, if I'm dealing, if I'm working with a group and I've got let's say a six week, six to eight week preseason block, um, then obviously I want to get the information as quickly as I can, mm -hmm. like as as close to day one as possible, at least on CMJ, for me to understand very much the force of your velocity, like what have they been doing lately and where are they at now. So, I mean, the buckets, the, the groups of athletes, however you determine that, could be very clear, um, depending on what's the But, as quickly as I can uh, from the start, then my general program can start there. If you start thinking about neurological and or like actual uh, strength adaptation, I probably would not need to test them for another two or three weeks. And understanding that if I test them in a week or a week and a half, then most of that's going to be neural. And that's fine, then we get switched on and whatnot. So if I've got a six week training block, I'll probably test them day one, week three, 
weeks. Um, if I have the luxury to have a little bit longer of a block, like eight weeks, then I'll do it with two weeks. Because then, if, because I have more time, in theory, I should have more time to enact more change or adaptation. In that case, I'll probably be testing more for a different purpose. And that purpose would be to uh, get information to understand how the program is developing and where I need to go. The less time someone gives me, the less I'm likely to do testing for the reason of creating programs to institute longer change. Uh, so with the six weeks, again, I'll do it every two or three weeks. But then also the same thing for eight weeks. You know, for the same reason, but again, now that I have two weeks less, now you start thinking about, okay, what kind of actual uh, impacts can I have? Yeah. I, I wouldn't do it for monitoring so much. Because again, if it's day one of pre and my mind goes to here, if it's day one of preseason, I'll, I'll probably have a lot of folks that are new to the program. And so if I start saying, okay, we're going to do monitoring for everybody, I mean, right off the bat, those folks I might not have any kind of data on whatsoever. Um, so obviously the returners, I've got some information so long as I've been doing monitoring in the same format before. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Where do you start with that? I'd say two, three weeks, but understanding that the earlier, the better but then trying to keep it consistent because, and now you're talking about logistics. If I can't test uh, a women's or a men's soccer team or a cross squad or something like that, 20 plus players, even though three reps take less than 30 seconds, I understand how logistics go completely. Um, it doesn't have to be that it's all or nothing. So long as during week two or three, I can get everybody jumping, I'm good. So long as they don't take that and say, okay, now I'm gonna be monitoring. Because if I tested the three of us, on a Tuesday morning, and I tested those two on a Wednesday afternoon, obviously now it's going to be a bit different, obviously. Um, so, to answer your question, day one and two to three weeks during a preseason period, but then after that, it's going to be so, okay, why are we doing the testing? Is it monitoring and that's going different? Or is it going to be during blocks of the season that is different? Um, so, day one and then two to three weeks. Um, consistency is awesome, but I wouldn't not test because I can't get everybody on in one day. Because that leads to number three, why are we doing the testing? Is it to do the monitoring part? That's different. Different metrics, different tests, consistency of that. But then if it's just, okay, let's see how they're progressing during the preseason block, two, three weeks is fine for me to start understanding how they going in the right direction. Yeah. That was no particular order. But I think I should have started with the first one. Why are we doing the testing? It's a big bad <laughs> To feedback on that too, so um, like if you were using it for monitoring purpose, is what um, from a statistical standpoint, what do you use to to measure change? Yeah. Right? Like we like we typically will use like Z score. Yeah. From you know baseline or, or from sure. Like, is there any other methods that you like to use yeah. Like yeah. Like to measure Z score is a great way to go. Um, folks also play with or look at standard deviations. Uh, you know, typically they folks are within one standard deviation of a rolling average um, or a rolling period. Uh, it's probably less cost for concern. So if you do one and a half or two standard deviations, now you think, okay, why are they doing such different performance than they have in the last two, three weeks? Um, but no, I think these scores are, they, they balance, they incorporate the individual data, but then remembering you know, what time period you want to use that to change what that number could be. Um, so yeah, I think anything between two, two, week, two to four weeks uh, in, in that range, if we're looking at monitoring, because it also depends what time of the season we're in. So if we're talking about, okay, what it has this person's number been, or a score or standard deviation, what stats are we looking to run from the first six weeks of preseason training for, you know, I mean, I'm going to say for a rookie, but I mean, it could be any player, depending on a few factors. For the first six weeks of preseason, I expect to see a little bit more variation. Because they're going to be getting their butts kicked in the weight room, on the field, on the court, in the, in the pool, da 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 da. That's going to be different. So the numbers might fluctuate quite a bit. They might have different uh, training loads each week. Now we're talking about sports science and how much the coaches, uh, him or her, or they subscribe to that and have the periodization program, et cetera. There's lots of stuff in the first month to six weeks 
that could be all over the place for a z-score. So then you start thinking about, okay, do I want to incorporate more of a longitudinal picture and say, okay, what would this z-score the last month from day one to now, a preaching or a training camp, compared to last year's average or last year's distribution? Now you start to incorporate, okay, well that person was a rookie last year, now they're second year, clearly I see the numbers on the page from the weight room, I see visually feedback from the coach, this is a different athlete, different person, because they're maturing, et cetera, et cetera. How much does that factor into my evaluation of what today's jump scores were? I said, oh, today's jump scores, plus two standard deviations from the last month of preseason training. Okay, that sounds great, but then how does that factor into the last year? Oh, last year? Okay, well, they actually negative two cent deviation. Then it's like, okay, it might be one of the slow burn, not slow burn, but slow starters. They start here, uh, hard, hard training week, oh, they're kind of coming up. Now they start to hit their stride a bit in week two, week three. You know, things, that initial, you know, ice water that kind of up of, of the training program is, is running off a little bit. Um, but then a lot of the positive changes are, are staying. So yeah, the question is just, can the question Z-scores? Send deviation, but like what time periods? Right. It, it, a lot of factors right. into that. Yeah. Right. Good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Thank yeah, I appreciate it, Kurt. That was yeah. great. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we got like a third of the way through.